Minigames exist to give you a break from the regular gameplay, like when you settle in for a hand of Gwent after a monster hunt in The Witcher, or when you pause the game, go sit in the corner, and get your breathing back under control after another nemesis encounter in Resident Evil 3. Ah! These minigames will usually make sense in the context of the main game. Not always, though, as you'll see in these following seven minigames, which had us wondering if we'd accidentally stumbled into a different game and it had just taken us a while to notice. Enjoy and beware minor spoilers for the following. One of the afternoon watch and all's well. I hope I see you well, sir. As you'd expect from a company that convinced us Fallout 76 was going to be good, Bethesda's usually pretty good at persuasion. I read on the internet that our games have had a few bugs. In their video games like Skyrim and the recent Fallouts, the way persuasion works is that when you level up, you put points into your speech stat, then when you're talking to people you'll be given persuasion conversation options along with your chance of succeeding. It also helps if you put on a particularly charismatic hat. Mayor McDonough, I can help you, but not when you're holding a hostage. Let her go. Oh, all right. She can go. This wasn't always the case, as anyone who remembers the truly bizarre Speechcraft minigame from The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion can tell you. Whenever you wanted to try and persuade someone of something in Oblivion, you needed to play this minigame, wherein you were presented with a persuasion wheel divided into four quarters, marked admire, coerce, joke, and boast. You should be ashamed. Each quarter also had a different sized orange wedge in it, indicating how strong the reaction to that selection would be. After each choice, the wedge would rotate once clockwise, and to complete the minigame, you had to use all four responses, at the right times, to try and maximise the target's disposition. You know, like a real conversation. Remarkable. How could you tell how a target would respond to you? Because highlighting each response caused them to wildly gurn their way through various different facial expressions, like they had their hands tied behind their back and were trying to dislodge a spider from their face. Well done. It was a bit harder to read the Argonians on account of them having lizard faces, but the Khajiits were easy. Those ears are a dead giveaway. I mean, Oblivion's faces weren't exactly photorealistic to begin with, but you've got to admire the misplaced confidence that led to someone thinking that these lumpen mugs were so expressive that you'd be able to study the faces LA Noir style for subtle tells that would guide you towards making the right choices. Obviously what we ended up with were NPCs either sporting face-splitting grins that looked like they'd been dosed with Smilex, or angry frowns like you'd just told them you ran over their dog. Don't try to manipulate me. Ironically, this is the face I make when I'm playing Fallout 76. Yakuza Zero is the most wildly inconsistent game in terms of tone that I've ever played. Play for an hour and on the one hand you'll experience horrifying self-mutilation, tense standoffs with mobsters, and brutal combat sequences straight out of an action movie. On the other hand, you will also experience spectacularly wacky side missions where you sing karaoke, teach a dominatrix how to be more assertive, or help a Michael Jackson impersonator fight off a horde of zombies. So it's saying something that even against this backdrop of wildly varying tone, the Telephone Club minigame stands out as one of the most incongruous minigames I've ever tackled. The Telephone Club is unlocked in Chapter 5 when protagonist Kiryu is supposed to be consolidating his position in the murky world of Tokyo's 1980s real estate boom. These clubs are a throwback to the game's 1980s setting, places where patrons could go and pay a fee to talk to people on the phone, usually to try and find a romantic partner. This is a Yakuza game though, so rather than a sedate conversation over the phone, the Telephone Club minigame begins with Kiryu setting the record for the world's most dramatic answering of a telephone. And then continues with a bizarre conversational shoot 'em up in which you have to select the right response, charge up your telephone beam by rotating the right stick like the dial on a rotary phone, and then fire, being careful not to hit the other catastrophically awkward conversation options that are suddenly crowding the correct answer like paparazzi around a Kardashian. Yes, I saw that. Thank you. 
get enough responses right, and you get a shot at what the game calls the Vital Questions Roulette, where you get to artlessly ask the girl to describe her body and look way prouder of yourself than that really justifies. <sighs> Get responses wrong, of course, and things will start to get awkward. Funny, though. <laughs> this minigame is actually pretty hard. Charging your telephone beam is surprisingly tricky, the responses travel in an arc, and all the wrong answers that are dancing in front of you trying to distract you are often sarcastically large and almost impossible to miss. Persevere, though, and you can win over your chat buddy, something the game represents with a big door with love written behind it. You know, the classic symbol. Then you can arrange to meet up with your date and, as a bonus, have someone to sit and watch you do karaoke in future. Ah, how whimsical. Right, now back to slamming people's heads in car doors. Final Fantasy X-2 was the 2003 sequel to Final Fantasy X, in which heroines Yuna and Riku join up with moody new girl Pain to form a kind of treasure-hunting Charlie's Angels. Because every girl gang needs a nemesis, Final Fantasy X-2 also added rival Hunter LeBlanc. Uh, LeBlanc! Remember that name well, loves. Ah, the thief. Is she trying to thieve a complete outfit because she's 35% of the way there? <laughs> At the very least, LeBlanc has thieved a mystical sphere belonging to Yuna and friends, and thus comes the inevitable point in a treasure hunting trio's career when you have to secretly infiltrate the base of a rival crew. Okie dokie, let's change! When that time comes, you better hope the foot soldiers of that rival crew have a conveniently face covering uniform. Oh, they do, that's good. Say, those are nice uniforms. And you better hope those foot soldiers misplace said uniform conveniently near where you're having a bikini splash fight. Oh, they have. That's good. Look, they forgot something. That sure was easy. From then on, it's a simple case of disguising yourself as the enemy, sneaking into the enemy's chateau, and then giving the enemy a sensual back massage. Wait, what? I'm waiting. Apparently, LeBlanc's uniformed lackeys, as well as being combat operatives, are also trained masseuses, whose responsibilities include helping the boss unwind with regular back rubs. You, go to the boss's chambre and tend to your duties. So it befalls you, the pretend lackey, to pummel the stress out of LeBlanc's deep tissue in a minigame that comes more out of nowhere than the ending of Now You See Me, or a reference to the movie Now You See Me in the year 2020. Oh. We have to assume that Yuna has no professional massage therapy qualifications, which makes this curious minigame, in which you apply pressure to a grid representing LeBlanc's back and shoulders, at least as dangerous as it is bizarre. Are back rubs supposed to crack like this? If you do avoid breaking the boss's spinal column, you accumulate satisfaction points, while she gives you feedback so enthusiastic you can only hope it ends up on a lackey salary review somewhere. Ooh, you're good! This seems appropriate. Keep at it until LeBlanc is all blissed out on massage minigame, then she falls asleep and you can get on with stealing your stuff back. Oh, I'm that good? Either that or you've snapped her spine, Yuna. Whichever it is, job well done. Minigames and fighting games tend towards using your incredible array of punches and kicks to perform feats of strength, <laughs> or just to destroy private property. Tekken Tag Tournament, however, decided that maybe players had had enough of all that violence and instead might just like to play a nice relaxing frame of 10-pin bowling. No idea why they thought that, but obviously they did, because look, here it is in the game. Tekken Bowl, as this minigame is known, lets you pick from the entire roster of fighters, most of whom literally want to kill each other, and take them for a fun night at the bowling alley, or rather a makeshift bowling alley, set up in a dojo, with an audience of monks and lesser Tekken characters using golden statuettes of Heihachi as pins. 
Those hoping for some, any kind of connection to the fact that Tekken is a fighting game, such as characters punching the pins or destroying them with Devil Gene chest lasers, will be disappointed. Turns out it's a pretty standard bowling minigame, with you choosing the direction and power of your shot and trying not to overcharge your throw, otherwise your character will accompany the ball down the lane, crashing into the pins and presumably hurting themselves quite badly, something the game feels compelled to replay nine times. Weird as it is to see a bunch of highly trained kung fu assassins amicably bowling together, you kind of have to admire the amount of thought that went into this. During the aiming part of the bowling minigame, regular human characters see things normally, while combat robot Jack has a sophisticated targeting system, and clockwork weirdo Yoshimitsu has a robo samurai heads up display. <laughs> Tekken Bowl reappeared in Tekken 5 Dark Resurrection and most recently in Tekken 7, where the entire roster can go bowling, including guest characters. So if you've ever wanted to see how Noctis from Final Fantasy XV deals with a 7-10 split, now's your chance. Spare. But might be time to leave when Negan from The Walking Dead shows up. I hear that guy's got a temper. Easy peasy lemon squeeze. Got something that might interest you. <laughs> the merchant in Resident Evil 4 is one of the most mysterious characters in video games. Who is he? Why is he here? And why does he talk like one of Disneyland's animatronic pirates? Stranger. <laughs> what you need that for? Go and hunt an elephant. Possibly the most baffling thing about the merchant is the fact that not only has he ventured into the giant fortress belonging to the Los Illuminados cult, which has to be the most dangerous place for hundreds of miles in any direction, but also that he's decided to set up a carnival shooting gallery there. You know, for fun. Welcome. To be fair, it is a very large castle, so the parasite-infected death cult that lives there probably aren't checking every room, but if you remember earlier in this sentence when I said parasite-infected death cult, you might start to see that it's still a bad idea. Anyway, what's done is done, and the upshot is that this spooky horror castle does contain a fun shooting gallery for Leon Kennedy to enjoy when he isn't suplexing monks. It gets even weirder once you start playing and realise the merchant has populated his shooting gallery with wooden targets representing notable actual villagers, which can't have gone down well with the locals. In no small feat of engineering, the targets also move, and various sections of the range slide back to reveal new parts of the shooting gallery. And is this what you're spending all the money I pay you for guns on, the merchant? I'm not telling you how to run a business, dude, but you're not even charging for the shooting gallery, come on! In a crowning achievement of weirdness, if you do well, you're rewarded with what the game calls bottle caps, which are painstakingly modelled figurines of you and your most hated enemies that each have a built-in sound chip. Don't worry, Ashley. I'm coming for you! So presumably, at some point, the merchant was following you around, secretly recording you. OK, that has replaced the mutant regenerators as the creepiest thing in this game. Nice work, merchant. <laughs> Thank you. The red one at number three. B for stamina. C for guts. Strong in the home stretch. The third most popular duck. What's this? The duck ring. Do you want to try? A big part of Shenmue 2's appeal was its minigames. I mean, I assume. It definitely wasn't the main story missions. Jeez. Steady there. Diversions such as arcade games, gambling, and street fights helped to make the game's Hong Kong feel like a real believable city full of unique characters, and gave you something to do to put off yet another story mission in which you're required to carry crates with all the frantic urgency of continental drift. People were crying when they announced Shenmue 3 at E3. I mean, so was I, but for different reasons. Anyway, while Shenmue is full of minigames, most of them make sense in the context of the game. Not all of them, though, as you'll discover if you come across Hong Kong's illegal clandestine duck racing scene. I mean, I assume it's illegal. Sounds like it should be. Located in a seedy alley and only accessible after you've taken part in some underground street fighting, the duck races let you gamble on the outcome of a race between various fleet-footed waterfowl. 
You pick your favourite duck, place a bet, and then the ducks, who it should be pointed out are all wearing fetching bow ties, waddle off down the street at breakneck speed, and did I mention Ryo is supposed to be looking for his father's killer? Because he is. <laughs> Yes, I am very impressive. After you've been to the duck races for the first time, Ryo can get his own duck by punching one out of a tree, but viewer, I regret to inform you that it is both sassy and horny for human babes. Yeah. Alright, let's go! Beat all the other ducks with your terrible duck, however, and you can face the ultimate duck, a penguin. This penguin better turn out to be Ryo's father's killer, or this is going to have been a real waste of time. Mortal Kombat games don't tend to be about using your head. They tend to be about using someone else's head. As a baseball. PS2 game Mortal Kombat Deception changed all that with the chess combat minigame, which was not only a more cerebral, strategic take on combat of the mortal variety, but also the only Mortal Kombat minigame where they couldn't change the letter C into a K and still have it make sense. Should have gone with Kaplunk Combat instead. What a game that is! Naturally, developer Midway looked at the grandfather of all board games, chess, beloved of kings and philosophers alike, which has survived basically unchanged for well over a thousand years, and thought, we can definitely improve on this. That's why Chess Combat shakes up how each piece can move, allows you to place traps on the board before a match begins, and adds power-up squares. Power-up power squares! Why didn't they think of that in 6th century India? More importantly, every time you try and take a piece, you have to participate in a one round fist fight. Damage to each piece is cumulative, but the aggressor gets a minor health advantage and then bonuses are applied. I get the feeling chess grandmaster Gary Kasparov wouldn't be quite as good at this version. And I bet his fatality is rubbish. To further complicate matters, you have to choose which character plays which chess piece. Do you pick your favourite character to be a grunt because you'll have more of them, or do you choose to make them your champion, who can move the most freely and aim to keep your powder dry for an attempt at checkmate? Honestly, it's probably even more strategic than real chess. Carefully select your team, keep an eye on your bonuses and judiciously pick your battles and you'll eventually be able to position yourself for a final confrontation with the other team's leader where the odds of you getting a checkmate are stacked in your favour. That's using your head. No, wait, that's using their head again. As a chew toy this time. Checkmate. Player one takes the leader. There you go, those are seven of the most WTF minigames we have ever encountered in video games. Why don't you let us know some more weird minigames that you've played in your video game career in the comments below. And if you want to watch more videos uh, from us, then why not check out some of our recent live streams like uh, this one, where me and Mike compared our game collections to see who has got the worst game collection by checking our Metacritic scores. That was a lot of fun. And we've got a nice live stream here where Luke and Ellen compared their Animal Crossing villagers to see who has the most valuable roster of Animal Crossing animals. That was a lot of fun too. So check out both those videos and we will see you next time on Outside Xbox. Thanks for watching.